called satisfaction. We always think when we get to that station, this will be it. This will be that satisfaction I'm looking for. You know, as growing up, wasn't it when I turn 18 and get out of the house? Anybody remember thinking that? Or did you like having your laundry done? Or when I, when I can buy that new Mercedes? Or my next promotion? Or lose weight? Get married? Have kids in the house and then want the kids out of the house? Or the mortgage? Get it paid off. The second home or retire so the pressure will be off. Happily ever after. That's the train of more. And that train of satisfaction says, wow, if you had that, you're going to pull into the station and you're going to be satisfied. But the train of more will never get us to the station of satisfaction. You know, it's when we pursue satisfaction, having more, it's like trying to run after the horizon. Remember that the joy is in the journey. When we are on that train, it's not about more. It's about listening to God's voice, doing what he asks us to do, serving one another, serving him, praying for one another. These things give us great satisfaction in this life. And Ordberg goes on to write, he says, On that day when we will see God face to face, then our longings for glory Beauty, love, and meaning will be fully realized. Then the restless human race will finally cry out, Enough. And God will say, More. He will satisfy every desire. It's found in contentment. When we can live that way, when we can find that contentment, our eyes will be open to the important things of life. We begin to live that life of satisfaction in the here and now, not total, but walking in it. And secondly, something that Jeremiah said was, pray for your captors. And I'm sure that Jeremiah 29, 7, he said, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And I'm sure these Hebrew people were sitting there thinking, You want us to pray for those that carried us away from Jerusalem and into captivity? Have you lost your mind? But that's exactly what the Lord told Jeremiah to tell him. Pray for those who have done those things to you, that whose decisions and actions have hurt you. That was one of the things I brought away from that visit on Friday, was that in in unforgiveness... It's a trap. In that unforgiveness, you're always going to find yourself in that situation where your mind is focused on that rather than on him. You're going to find yourself in captivity to that unforgiveness. When we're bitter towards other people or hatred towards this non-Christian world, that's not what God wants us to be. Jesus said in Matthew 5.44, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, I've read that many times. And still, there's always that little something in me that when someone wrongs me, I go, Hmm, you know, I hope they get what they deserve. Well, I should be saying, Lord, you know, bless them as you have blessed me. Maybe if they see you, maybe if they can experience something from you, it will change them. And that is my prayer. That is the prayer that God was asking of those Hebrew people right then and there. He was saying, pray for them. Pray and watch. Pray and watch what I will do in their lives. A few years ago, I preached on a a missionary lady named Rachel Saint. And she had a nephew named Steve Saint. Steve Saint's dad was Nate Saint. That's a lot of saints. (laughs) But Nate met a tragic end in the Amazon jungle. He was a pilot, and he and four other men were doing mission work to a tribe that had never been, uh, never experienced uh, the outside world. And they were killed. Steve, Steve learned that his dad would never be making that trip home. And his aunt Rachel and his aunt Betty 
and a woman from that tribe who had, who had uh, gotten out and come to the civilization. They were working with her, and she said, it's time. My group of people will allow you in now. And so that, those two aunts who had lost their brother to this tribe went back as missionaries. And they were accepted and began to preach the word of God to them. And they, were, they said, invite anyone you want to our, to our tribe. And so they did, and they invited Steve and his mom and his sister. And they came also to live among the same people that had killed their dad and her husband. Even though they took their lives, they had forgiveness. And he goes on to write that during this time, McKay, one, the one that actually did kill his dad, became like a father to him and a grandfather to his children. Are you crazy? What does that take? It takes a heart of forgiveness. It takes a heart of prayer. It takes one that you're understanding who God is and how he loves and how he forgives. That whole tribe came to know the Lord, every one of them, because of one man's ability to forgive, one sister's ability to forgive. Folks, you don't know what could change in your life. If you were to approach someone that has done you wrong, begin to pray for them first so that your heart is in the right place, and then begin to maybe write a letter, correspond in some way, open up a door of conversation. You will never know what effect that will have on the kingdom of God when you make that kind of outreach part of your life. Not letting any stone go unturned, and I mean a heart of stone, but letting those hearts be soft towards those that have done you wrong. Pray for those. Pray for those. And third, we can't listen to bad counsel. Jeremiah 29, 8-9 says, Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. See, there are those around you, and there were those that Jeremiah was talking about, the Lord was speaking to. They would say, hey, this is going to be over quick. You know, God might have said 70 years, but his timing's never quite like that. You're going to get out before no time. You know, and their ears, that made their ears happy to hear that. And so they wanted to hear these guys rather than Jeremiah over here saying, okay, you're going to be here 70 years. Okay, let's get this right. Let's get right with God. It was all stuff they had to do, and these other guys were telling them, okay, it's going by quickly. You'll be back in no time. We have people like that that are making promises to us all the time. They're saying, hey, if you live this Christian life, if you live for God the right way, you're going to have a big house and lots of money. You know, when people do hurt you, you know, God says an eye for an eye. You can get even. Yeah, no, You know, they even try to say when Jesus is coming back or that there's never going to be a judgment. They say that all religions are the same or that Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. Those kind of statements tickle the ears of those that want to hear an easier way. Something that makes it sound like, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, doesn't matter what I do as long as I'm not hurting anyone else. You've heard all those things. They tickle the ears. But God says that's bad counsel. Bad counsel. That captivity lasted exactly 70 years. You know, you just open yourself up for more heartache when you begin to listen to the lies. Remember, we have the infallible truth in God's word. That's where our counsel comes from. Grounded in his word. And to understand, number four, that God is in control. This is 29, 10 through 11. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. Many of us have heard this verse, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It's a great promise from Scripture. It's one that, you know, we can look to God and we say, yes, I know you have a plan for me. It's a promise that you've given me. They saw it fulfilled 70 years. They were returned to Jerusalem. A lot of them said, hey, 70 years, I won't even be alive. What kind of promise is that? But God knew the exact time that they needed to be in that country. He knew the exact time because he accomplished a lot during those 70 years. If you know some of the stories from Scripture, they happened during that Babylonian captivity. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the child's story. When they went into the furnace, they wouldn't bow down and worship any god but God alone. They became the greatest administrators of the Babylonian Empire. And you remember Daniel, the lion's den. But you also remember he interpreted a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came to know the Lord because of Daniel's testimony to him. And that, be, that showed great favor to the children of Israel. Daniel 4.37 says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. This is coming from a pagan king that had come to know the Lord through Daniel. What did he write there? Praise to God. The God of Daniel, it says in that, he saw that God was true. And then through that time, First and Second Kings was written, and Chronicles, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Psalm 137. All those came from that time of captivity. So in that 70 years, a lot happened because of the obedience of a few. And then the whole nation began to say, we need to get right with God. And they did. Their time out punishment was for their benefit. God used that time that they could come and repent of their evil. And he pointed them in the right direction. Jeremiah said, your own conduct and actions have brought this upon you. They came to the point where they recognized. That's exactly where I was on Friday. Coming to the point where you recognize that it's by your own actions that these things have happened. When we're doing this and this and this, we're never going to get right with him. It's only when we begin to say, Lord, what is it within me that caused me to be in the wrong place at the wrong time or doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, having the wrong thoughts, being judgmental, being hateful, being bitter, all those things. What was it? And then repent of those things, and you're going to see God working on your behalf to bring you to this point where you can see that big picture. God is working behind the scenes. They couldn't see it to start with, but they began to praise him for what he was doing. There was an old man, and he was very poor. And in an attempt to provide for his family, he took all that he had, and he bought a horse. And I thought this was very appropriate for us in here. <laughs> I've had a couple racehorses. And my neighbors were probably saying, or at least the neighbors here on the track were saying, what's this chaplain got himself into? Uh, Gib McClanahan told me one time, you start out with a mare, you're going to have one tied to every fence post before you get done. Wait, I had to get it under control fast. You think, oh, 11 months, another one comes? Yeah, that's not that quick. I had three before I realized this is getting rather expensive. But the neighbors... They thought the same thing, and they said, wow, that's foolish of you to do that, to put all your money into a horse. You know, things can happen to horses. And sure enough, the horse went missing. And the townspeople said, oh, what a tragedy. And this old man, he was wise. He said, we don't know if this is a tragedy or a blessing. And a few days later, the horse returned. Trailing behind him was a herd of 15 wild mustangs. Townspeople, you were right. This was a blessing and not a tragedy. And again, the old man said, we don't know if this was a blessing or a tragedy. His only son was breaking one of the Mustangs, and he was thrown to the ground. While on the ground, the horse trampled him, 
and shattered his leg. The townspeople said, oh, this is truly a tragedy. Your son is now crippled for life. And the old man's response, we don't know yet if it's a blessing or a tragedy. It happened right before the war started and all the other young men in town went off to battle and were all killed. But his son, because he was crippled, wasn't able to go. None returned and his son was with him. And the townspeople say, now we understand. You see, we aren't capable of judging the effects of the good or the bad in our lives. Think about that. You don't know if something that's going on right now that you think is just terrible is going to turn into a blessing, or you don't know what a blessing you might have that could turn into a tragedy. We don't have the necessary perspective to see that. But God does. God knows exactly by our actions, by our decisions, the outcome that it's going to have. And he was always for us, as that scripture said. He is the one that reigns. He is in control and he has a grand design. Proverbs 16.9 says, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Where do you want to be? Are you somewhere where you don't want to be right now? Are you listening to God's instructions or people telling you, hey, you know, if you do this little shortcut, things will go much easier for you. Just put that person out of your mind. You know, just let, let evil happen to them. You know, get off on your own. Or are you praying for those captors or those that have brought pain into your life? Look for the joy. Trust in good counsel. And build your life based on the scripture. God is always in control. And I wanted to end with Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13. It says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And it goes on. I wanted to read the rest of it. And I will bring you back from captivity. That's the rest of that promise. A promise that God has made to you and he's made to me and each, each and every one that looks to him. I have a promise for you. And I've seen it carry out. I've seen it in times that I just thought I was crushed beyond ever getting off the ground. And praying to the Lord, I know he heard my cry. I know he heard my prayer and he was listening and he drew me near to himself. Call on God. Ask for his help. As we have communion today, this is a wonderful way to go into communion is thinking about what God has done for us. He's done so many wonderful things. Bobby's going to come forward. We're going we're gonna to have you come forward starting with this side. We're going to take the elements, go back to where we're sitting. And as you're sitting there, think about this sermon today. Think about who it is you need to be praying for and pray for them. Ask who God has in store for you to make a difference in their life as we take communion today.
truly does give us that peace. For despair. Sorry. I really hope you had time to, to take a moment in your hearts and just think about all of this about that time out that the Hebrew people had and the time out it took for them to see that they needed to repent. You know, it seems that Saturday night comes along and that's, you know, I'm always burdened by the mistakes I've made during the week. I don't, I, I must be a good Baptist <laughs> because it always gets me on Saturday night when I'm thinking about a Sunday. And I hope your heart's maybe in a, in a different way, but in a similar way, that you're not at rest when things aren't right. And this is an opportunity that when, when we come before the Lord and we take these elements, that we see that he's just saying to me, Daryl, I'm always willing to forgive. Are you willing to bend that knee? That's what this is all about. As the Lord was at that meal and he, he broke that bread, he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Even though the disciples, they didn't understand it fully, what the Lord was saying. But Jesus knew, and he knew what it would take. He knew what he had to do from the foundations of the world. He always knew that the redemption was going to come through him. And as he shed that blood on the cross, it was for that forgiveness that I started talking about. And he took that cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord, as we have taken this communion, we remember everything that you did. You did for the Hebrew people. You've done for us. Through the experiences that we have from you, we know we can trust you. We know that you are faithful to forgive us, 